This video is of a spreadsheet that you can actually get into yourself and practice what I'm teaching here. Uh, you can go to the description for this video and there is a link in that description that will take you to this actual spreadsheet. So what this spreadsheet is trying to do is practice projectile motion. I'm going to scroll down here and there's going to be a ball that rolls down this ramp. It's going to turn and then start coming horizontally. But the ball is going to leave the ramp right there and it's going to fly through the air and we want it to hit all eight of these rings or go through the center of all eight of those rings as it flies through the air. So we have to calculate where to place these rings. Not only how far down to place these rings, but what angle to place each of these rings as well. These rings are, will move up and down on these rods. They really don't move side to side. So they are at a kind of a fixed horizontal position for each of these. And we just have to figure out how far down to drop each of these rings and then the angle. I don't have it shown in the picture here, but there would be a photo gate timer, a little electric eye that when the beam, when the ball breaks the beam of light from the first one, it starts the timer. And when it goes through the next beam of light, it stops the timer and it can very accurately measure how much time it takes to go a certain distance. So let's come back up here and th this would be the data that I would have collected, the distance between the gates and then how much time it took to go that distance. So velocity is going to be just distance divided by time. And I do have these cells set uh, formulas in the background here that will make the cell turn green if you get the right formula, just so you know you're on the right track. So it looks like our ball was going about 1.9 meters per second along this horizontal here. And once it leaves the end of the ramp, it's going to keep on going horizontally at 1.9 meters per second. All those distances I had in that picture below are also shown here. The, the, sorry, all those distances are, are shown here. So one of the things that we ha are going to typically find first is how much time it takes to get to our target. Time is often the thing we find first. So if I know how fast that object was traveling and how far away it has to go to get to that first target, I can calculate the time. So here's our kinematic equations, but horizontally it was not accelerating. So that term is going to disappear and we're going to say the end of the ramp is at zero. And we want to figure out how far past the end of the ramp we're going to be. In the vertical direction, it is accelerating. So we have to factor gravity in there, but it was not thrown up or down. So that term is zero. And then the velocity in the horizontal direction is just going to be this, this instantaneous velocity is going to be the same as its initial velocity, regardless of time, because it wasn't accelerating. In the y direction, the instantaneous velocity is going to be the acceleration of gravity times time. Okay, I think we're ready to do this first one. It's going to be a formula, so we have to hit equals. And if the horizontal position is horizontal velocity times time, we know how far away that first ring is and how fast it's traveling. So we can find time by taking distance divided by velocity. So if I take this distance divided by that velocity, it, it says it's going to get to that ring in about 0 0.063 seconds, about six hundredths of a second to arrive at that first ring. Now this is a formula that referred to this cell and that cell. If I copied that formula down, it, that B10 is going to change to B11 and it will use that number here. But the D5 would change to D6 and there's a little cell here, it's very small, but there's row 6. I don't want it to go to row 6, I always want it to refer back to row 5, so I'm going to put a dollar sign in front of row five, in front of the number five. A dollar sign is just the syntax that holds it at row five. So if I select that formula 
and copy that formula all the way down. It's going to take about six hundredths of a second to go that far, and it's going to take about uh, 0.435 seconds to go that far. But we know the time it's going to arrive at each of these rings. So in the time that it takes to go from here to here, it's going to drop some distance. And as the time that it takes to go from here to here, it's going to drop some distance. And we can go back to the vertical direction here and figure out the distance it's going to drop knowing acceleration and time. Looks like just one half acceleration times time squared. So the vertical distance dropped is going to equal one half or just 0.5 times gravity. And I have a cell here for gravity. This is what it is here in Arvada, Colorado. Uh, if you uh, live somewhere else, gravity might be just a little bit different. So you'd want to look it up for what it is in your place. I do always want to hit that cell there at G3. So I'm going to put dollar signs around uh, that. Uh, I have a keyboard that has F keys. If I hit F4, it puts dollar signs around there for me. And if I hit F4, it will change from freezing both the column and the row to freezing just the row, freezing just the column, or freezing nothing. And I just really want to hold it right there. So this is one half of gravity times time squared raised to the power of two. That is the caret symbol in its shift six. So one half gt squared, and it's going to uh, drop about almost two centimeters. So this first moment it hits this ring, the ball is going to drop about 1.9 centimeters. That number there. If I cl click on that, click and drag, and that last ring, ring number eight, uh, it's going to take this much time to arrive at that ring, but falling for that much time, it's going to fall that distance. All right, so now I know, know how far down to drop it. The rest of these cells are used to figure out at what angle to make the ring. I want the ring to be at 90 degrees to the direction of the ball. So when a ball goes through a ring, it has some velocity, magnitude and direction. And that velocity has a horizontal component and a vertical component. The horizontal component is always going to be this number here because it's going to keep going horizontally uh, that fast. But the vertical component is going to be going faster and faster and faster. Uh, the velocity in the horizontal direction is what it was originally. The velocity in the vertical direction is going to be accelerating with time. So if I know what this side is and this side is, I can use tangent of this angle. Tangent of that angle equals opposite over adjacent. So I can find out what that angle is. But let's find this first. The velocity vertical is just going to equal this acceleration with dollar signs times time. This was the time that it arrived. And that's what I'm doing here. Just the velocity in the vertical direction is acceleration times time. I hit enter, and that's how fast it's going to be traveling in the down direction when it hits that first ring. Copy my formula down, and that's how fast it's going to be traveling in the down direction when it hits that last ring. So if I know the horizontal component and the vertical component, I can say the tangent of that angle is equal to opposite over adjacent. I want to find out what the angle is, so I have to take the inverse tangent of both sides, the inverse tangent of opposite over adjacent, and the way we type that into a spreadsheet is a tangent of opposite over adjacent. Uh, it stands for the arc tangent and inverse tangent. Same thing. So when we, we use sine, cosine, or tangent, uh, spreadsheets are always locked into radian mode. So we'll, we will get an answer in radians. But we're going to type in a formula. It's a tangent of opposite over adjacent. 
the horizontal velocity is this number, and it's always going to be that number, so I hit dollar signs. Divided by the vertical velocity, but the vertical velocity is getting greater and greater and greater, but at this moment it had that velocity. No dollar signs on that number. And I hit enter, and it's going to be about 1.26 radians. I copy that down, and, and that's the angle of the ball right here. Uh, let's go ahead and turn radians into degrees. There is a formula that will turn radians into degrees, and it's just a, a function where you plug in an, an angle into the function and it makes it into degrees. So we're going to say degrees of that radian value, we're going to plug into a function called degrees, and it's 72 degrees. Copy that down. And this is the angle the ball is traveling at any time it goes through a ring. That's this angle here. We want the ring to be at 90 degrees to that, so they're going to be complementary angles. So what if this is 30 degrees, this needs to be at 60 degrees, so 90 minus 30. We can figure the angle the ring makes to the vertical by just taking 90 minus the angle there it is, copy it down, there we are. So this last ring here, we need to drop it vertically 92.8 centimeters, 0.928 meters, and we need to make sure it's at an angle of 65.8 degrees to the vertical. And you could um, put a protractor there with a plumb bob, like a little mass hanging from a string. And the, since the mass hangs straight down, uh, the protractor would measure the angle uh, to the vertical. And if you do that, the ball will go through all eight rings if you set it up carefully, and it's a pretty cool uh, understanding of projectile motion.